And tonight, three down, six more to go off as independent power producers begin to carry out threat to shut down plants ahead of the June 30 deadline unless government pays 30% of the $1.4 billion that owed them. Recently, we had of me to be collecting over $3 billion, but I can tell you on authority that we have not received a dime out of that. We cannot stretch ourselves beyond July 30th. What we are expecting is nothing but an alert on our account. Uh, and tonight we're learning of fresh details as the finance minister calls for a meeting with the independent power producers to avert a full-blown power crisis. Now, even though our application was dismissed, we have achieved what we actually ask. We ask for time for the candidate to be able to campaign. And we're keep our, keeping our eyes on the... Uh, James Jachi Kwesing case uh, as he has a leeway to campaign ahead of the 27 uh, by election as the trial resumes 48 hours after that poll. My name is Blessed Sugar, and Top Story, as always, is brought to you by Vodafone. Further together. And tonight we start off from the courts where the NDC's James Jachi Kwesing has been giving the leeway to firm up his campaign ahead of the June 27 by election. This is despite the fact that his path to hold a day to day hearing of his criminal trial failed at in the Accra High Court. The court has indicated it will resume proceedings two days after the polls and will commence uh, the daily hearings after uh, July 4. I want to bring in legal affairs correspondent Joseph Kable who was in court earlier today. Uh, and Joe, the reason for which the court dismissed the application by Mr. Kwesing, what are the grounds g- being given by this judge? The power that it exercises, it says it does share the power to determine how to manage its proceedings with the parties in the case, and that it is a power that the court on its own exercises, handed it by the constitution and the relevant laws that have been passed to regulate the activities of the court. And so the judge did indicate that as a result, in terms of the ruling that it gave on June 16, which indicated that the trial was going to take place on a daily basis after June 23 was within law and it had not been presented with any evidence to depart from that particular ruling. Uh, and and let's talk about the new dates now for, for the hearing of this case. And so the first date will be on June 29th, then the next one will be on July 4th, then afterwards uh, there will be the daily hearings. The court opted for June 29th to start first and foremost because ordinarily the courtroom where the case is held is not available on Monday. So that took Monday out. On Tuesday, the judge indicated that that is when they are saying not by election is taking place. And so it will not have a hearing on that day. Then the Thursday will be the 29th. Then in terms of the 30th, the, the court claimed it because of the fact that that day will be Martyrs Day, uh, who, which will be celebrating the three judges who were murdered uh, some time ago in the 80s. And so that is how come the court arrived at the decision to start on June 29th, come back on July 4th, and then the day-to-day hearing will take off. And how about the uh, team of James Jachi Kwesin? Uh, are they satisfied with this latest? A member of the legal team, Baba Jamal, tells me that as far as they are concerned, all what they needed was to give him ample time to campaign ahead of the June 27th polls. And so the fact that they have the opportunity to come to court on a day afterwards is not of concern to them. It's going to be 29th and uh, on the 4th. 29th June and on the 4th. What happened in court today, uh, even though our application was dismissed, but um, we have achieved what we actually asked for. 
we ask for time for the candidate to be able to campaign and then come back to court. So if the court, even though has dismissed our application, has also fixed the dates of 29th and uh, 4th July, that effectively also, I mean, achieve our aim. And so we are very happy with what has happened. We are going to study her uh, uh, ruling, uh, ruling, and then we will, we will know the next step to take. But for now, we are happy our candidate has the space to uh, uh, um, a campaign without any uh, inhibitions and any fear of being arrested at any point. For now, we are very happy with what has happened. Here. Is that to say that the day-to-day one that will take place after the 4th of July, with that one, you don't have any issues? No, no, we don't. We have said that already, that we don't have any issues. We can't take ourselves from uh, uh, trial. We can't run away from trial. What we wanted is for an equitable ground, equitable space for everybody to be able to campaign on his own. That's all what we're asking for. And even though our application has been uh, dismissed, I think that we have achieved what we wanted. Okay, so that's it for the James Jachi Khoisin side. Uh, and we know that uh, the Attorney General has been very much keen on this matter. Blay, what's his position? And so, uh, Deputy Attorney General Diana Sulaba Dapa, who represented the AG in court today, said they are happy that the court agreed with their view that fixing a day to day hearing is within the law. We are satisfied and not surprised because the court has only reinforced a time honored principle of rule of law. Uh, if you look at rule of law, one of the four principles is that access to justice must be timely by a competent authority. And so, and it's tried stri- it's as <clears throat> legal practitioners, it is not unusual for a court to make an order for a day-to-day hearing of a matter. And so we were not surprised. We're also happy that the court has only reinforced what is known. And this principle of rule of law is also replicated in the case management and practice direction that we have as a court. And so we are we are happy that at least there's closure and there's reinforcement of these principles. Thank you. Uh, so I want us to round off by talking about what we witnessed last time when, of course, this case was heard in court play. And, and you recall that we had big wigs of the National Democratic Congress show up in court as a form of solidarity for James Quayson. Did that happen today? No, Blazer. It was very different this time around. In fact, uh, we know that the other time, beyond the big wigs, there are a number of individual supporters who had come from Afin North to throw their weight behind Mr. Quayson's placards. They were upset in terms of the big wigs that made it this time around. There was former Attorney General Mareta Briapiopong, legal practitioner Tony Lita, and for the legal team, Chachuchi Kata and Baba Jamal and Terry Wajan. That's made up in terms of the appearances today. But we understand it's because the strength and the force of the party has been deployed to Afin North to do a last minute campaign to ensure that the NDC retains that particular seat. And that's my uh, colleague, Josefa Cable, who's uh, been monitoring events in court for us today. But, but tonight, there's an unfolding matter that we need to uh, bring up as well. The independent power producers uh, have been taking a tough stance to compel government to pay a significant fraction of the $1.4 billion debt owed its members. Already three of their power plants are off the national grid, leaving only six producing electricity for the country. Financial cons- uh, so, uh, constraints, uh, according to the Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber of Independent Power Producers, uh, is the main cause uh, for this challenge. Government owes the IPPs over 1.4 billion US dollars and has until the end of June to make a significant payment or risk plunging the country into darkness. The Finance Minister and the IPPs are in a critical meeting to uh, come to some agreement, but the CEO of the Chamber, Ali Klim, uh, Petokbo told Joy News ahead of that uh, talk that they will no longer tolerate any form of promises by government. You know, every contract, as far as payment is concerned, has credit base that your customer or the optical has to make a repayment for the services that has been rendered. We 
being due to your mental basis, and we expect them that within their respective credit days, they are supposed to return to us with payment for the services rendered. But it has not been the case. Recently, we had of ECB collecting over three billion, but I can tell you on authority that we have not received a dime out of that. This money did not even go to the cash waterfall. We don't receive anything from the cash waterfall again. So we don't really know what is happening. We have made our position clear that we cannot stretch ourselves beyond July 30th. Uh, what we are expecting is nothing but an alert on our account and no promises. We, we don't think we are in for that again. We have given uh, a reminder or request since uh, March. We gave an ultimatum that by March, we get about to go off. There were intervention people asking that we should hold on. We have held on. Now we have given another. I don't think this time we are able to stretch ourselves. Right? Uh, unless we receive our let uh, by June 30th, we will we'll go off the grid. And uh, the, the group is also sympathising with government over the challenges in trying to settle their debts. But uh, Mr. Petoko is indicating that they've run out of funding sources, hence that need uh, to pay up or risk losing the six plants uh, producing electricity. We have always borrowed privately to support the operations all this well. In a fair commercial sense, the cost of this borrowing should have they pass on to it to your government to pay. But we are absorbing all these costs on ourselves. And we said that well, our lenders, our creditors are not in position to give us anything further because those that we borrow, we are not able to pay. So if I cannot get poor to run my, my, my machine, how do I operate? And so it's not an issue of sympathizing with that we have done this by our actions. They can testify. It's just an issue that I don't just have the resource to run the plant. We have six that are functional, and uh, the rest are, let me say, done for quite some time now. But six of us are functional always. A majority of these beds belong to the six. Uh, so that's the position of the independent power producers. I want to bring in now ranking member of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, uh, John Jinapo. And uh, the last time we interacted on this matter, uh, you have the view uh, that there's an urgent need for government to release the funds, else we risk uh, losing power supply to this country. Already three out of the six are down. The issue between the IPPs and government is taking pretty uh, a serious twist, uh, I guess. So, so what's your take on the way forward now? We are in very, very turbulent, difficult times. We are in very, very precarious times. And if nothing is done urgently, this country would suffer some level of doom so that has never been witnessed before. Here we are, ECG is collected three billion. The norm is that all revenues collected from power sales ought to go through the cash waterfall mechanism. This is something all of us have adopted. And yet that three billion cannot be accounted for. I just heard the Chamber of Independent Power Producers, their spokesperson, indicate that they have received no payment. What about the power that has been sold? What about the money that has been collected in lieu of the power sold? Why is government deviating from the cash waterfall mechanism and using the money for other non-power related expenditure. The level of transparency in this sector is so opaque that if nothing is done, I'm telling you the whole power sector would collapse. And I'm very, very worried as a Ghanaian. This is not about politics. You've collected three billion, put that money in the cash waterfall mechanism. So that at least everybody will be cushioned a little. That can help sustain the system. But if no payment, you can't account for the money, then there's a major problem. And I think that it is gone beyond the finance minister. Uh, but I, but I guess uh, the that president at this point, step in 
and ensure that the right thing is done. Uh, but, but I guess at this point, there's hope, isn't it, when you have the finance minister reach out now officially to the independent power producers. Uh, should we not be hopeful that this engagement will yield uh, some positive results? But where is the money? That's the first thing. If the claims is collected $3 billion, and yet that money cannot be accounted for, the IPPs are not getting even 1% of the $3 billion, then what will the finance minister meeting them for? That's the first point of view. I'm also worried that with all the deputy ministers and ministers we have at the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Energy, they've gone mute, no level of assurance, no level of engagement. They are not speaking to the issue, and they've left everything in Abeya. That is not good, Governor. At least they should give some level of assurance to Ghanaians. They ought to explain and talk to Ghanaians on what they are doing in order to avert a possible load shedding of monumental proportions. I think that is a very, very serious matter, and it goes beyond the finance minister. Mm. I uh, think uh, that at your committee level in parliament, uh, I'm just wondering it, what you're considering now as the option. What I'm considering is that, first of all, ETG must put the money in the cash water for mechanism. As a matter of urgent, the IPP should at least receive something from these money that have been collected. We are talking of power sold, monies collected. Where are those monies? The IPPs are not that unreasonable. Even if you can't pay everything and you meet them halfway by making some appreciable level of payment, at least their financiers will see that the cash flow is moving forward. But if there is virtually no payment, where are they going to get money to service their plans? Where are they going to get money to pay their staff in order to continue to supply power? This is unacceptable. I think that every well-meaning Ghanaian ought to speak to this issue. It shouldn't be left to the NDC and you, the media, alone. And I commend you for bringing this up. But if we don't take time, eventually, we'll be plunged into a massive, massive, massive blackout that we've never witnessed before. Because one of the financiers, 10 of the financial support for this IPP, we are going to have a major, major problem. And, and we're hearing reports, unconfirmed though, that your committee, the Mines and Energy Committee in Parliament, may be meeting over this matter uh, this weekend. Uh, are you in a position to confirm that? We are meeting tomorrow over so many issues, right from GMPC, all and some other issues. I'm just on my way from Aston North because of this meeting. I'm leaving Aston North straight to Kuforidia for this meeting. I'm here to sit with the chairman, and so I'm sure when I meet the chairman, I uh, would normally have a conclave before the general meeting. These issues will be brought up, and I believe that we'll take them on. Uh, grateful for your company. That's uh, the ranking member on the Mice and Energy Committee in Parliament, uh, John Jinapo, spending some time with us. But um, what's the implication? And now that we have three of the national grid, the IPPs are mounting pressure for something to be done. Uh, let's hear from uh, Adam Yakubu, who's a, a programs officer at the Institute for Energy Security. Thank you uh, for your time. How should the finance minister handle negotiations with, with these IPPs uh, when yes, they uh, have already taken their stance on this matter? It's just uh, three more to go. We've lost three already. Yeah. So, um, first of all, let me say good evening to you and good evening to your listeners, wherever they are listening to us from. Um, the IPPs are so, as of now, but the current energy generation mix are so crucial that uh, the the finance minister, it didn't even have to take the finance minister this long to in, intervene because ideally the ECG is the, the one that is supposed to lead the negotiation because they are those who are supposed to provide the money to pay this IPP. ECG has not been able to do that proactively and so it takes the finance minister who has to step in to see if he can get cool heads to lie. But what does it mean for us as a country? We have come a long way with this. Currently, per the last tariff review by PURC, IPPs are doing 70% of our total power production. And so you can imagine if someone is doing more than half of your entire power supply, and the person is threatening you that they will shut down. Even if they decide to ration, they take out 50% of 
the entire supply they give us, that would mean that we'll have a big shortfall. And so this is not something we are willing to gamble. We have seen the repercussions of the energy crisis in Ghana. And so I'm not sure as a nation we are prepared given the, the, the economic turmoil the country is going through, if we should add power crisis to it, I'm sure the economy could collapse. Yeah. Uh, aside the IPPs, any way out for government? Um, currently, the, the ball is in the court of government because the IPPs have made their preposition. How much is government willing to give them? Then the conversation, because that was part of a discussion the other time and they are saying even if government should show some commitment at least half of what they are asking for so if they are asking for 30 if government even comes to the table with 15 percent and says this is what we have at the moment this is the the situation we find ourselves in as a country and these ipps are equally Ghanaians, and i'm not sure they are so heartless to take an entrenched position not to listen to the government they just need some commitment because, like uh, the honourable former uh, energy minister, deputy energy minister, had stated, the IPPs are asking for money for power that has already been generated and sold. So ideally, the monies have been collected. So the money should be given to them to pay off their operations costs and to give some assurances to their creditors and to their financiers that look, we are in viable business, and so you have to continue supporting us. Okay, Maybe briefly before we go, uh, the elephant in the room, the take or pay ag- agreements, it, it must be subject to some sort of an audit now, given the uh, International Monetary Fund requirements. Yes, uh, so the, the International Monetary Fund requirement is not about the take or pay agreement. Let me state this, that the take or pay agreements are insurance clauses that these power companies put into the arguments say that there's some guarantee that when the power is produced, at least some quantity of it will be paid for, whether you are taking it or not, just to give them that assurance. And as a country, we are not in a position to negotiate a take and a pay because of our economic situation. So it will be very, very difficult to get us take out that that particular clause. So even if you look at the recent arguments that have been signed with ACTA and all, you would see that clause repeated in those agreements and those are even for a longer period and so what we can do at the moment is let us get what is important now is let's get something for the IPP and let's find a way of what amortizing their debt over a period of time to clear it off then whilst we are working at it then we can strategically reposition the electricity company of Ghana to be more proactive in their revenue mobilization because the whole conversation starts from we are not able to collect enough because when we collect enough we'll be able to pay and if we are able to pay the IPPs will be able to supply but if they are supplying enough and we are not able to recoup the revenue then we would have a challenge as a country. Okay, uh, the picture is quite clear now. Adam Yakubu, Programs Officer for the Institute of Energy Security. Thank you uh, for joining us. Also to John Jinapo, Ranking Member on the Mind and Energy Committee. And that's it for Top Story with me. Blessed to go next. It's Ghana Connect. It's coming up shortly.